ولقد أنزلنا إليك آيات بينات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أفلا يتدبرون القرآن السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters الله بركاته Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks in the Qur'an, in fact many of times, do they not ponder and analyze these verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the Qur'an? And tonight, inshallah, we are going to do exactly that. We are going to ponder and analyze over these verses in order that we may understand the Qur'an in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down and two, so that we can leave out of here with a stronger, more firm conviction in our religion. The Qur'an is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the speech of Almighty God. And in addition to the Qur'an being a guidance to mankind, and in addition to the Qur'an being a means in which me and you can understand the stories of the prophets, and in addition to the Qur'an being or causing ease and comfort to its reciters. The Qur'an of its 6,000 verses dedicates 1,000 of these verses to scientific matters. 1,000 verses dedicated to geology and embryology, to hydrology and oceanology and cosmology and astrology. And one of the sciences in which we like a lot and the Qur'an talks about a lot is anatomy. For we look at our bodies and we see the amazing things about it. And we are stunned when we find new discoveries about our own bodies. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about something greater than the creation of your body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا أَمِ السَّمَاءِ he says, are you a greater creation or is it the heavens, the skies? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to me and you who constantly look at our bodies and we are amazed by it. And He gives us the answer because He asked us the rhetorical question of what is a greater creation, you or the heavens, the skies? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَخَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Akbar, Akbar min khalqin nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the creation of the heavens, the skies, and the earth is a greater creation than that of me and you and the mankind. The universe is something so great and unimaginable that it is said if we were to measure its, its diameter, it would take us 9 billion light years. And to put that in some type of perspective, one light year is a distance of six trillion miles. This is a great creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which me and you are going to discuss today through His words, through the Qur'an. And in Wallahi, it's an amazing thing that our religion, Islam, the Qur'an, has these wonders for me and you to ponder about these marvelous concepts in which me and you can find the true information about them. And tonight, we start the night with one of the greatest discoveries that man has ever had. And going back to the point in which I said, Alhamdulillah, that Islam has these, these concepts in it. I want to quote Albert Einstein in which he says, Science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Insha'Allah, the first concept in which me and you are going to discuss today about that which is above us is a concept in which Stephen Hawking says is the greatest discovery of the century. And although this concept was not known by man or proven by man by science, until 1929, and it wasn't proposed or even thought of until 1922. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an mentions it 1400 years ago. The Qur'an says, 
والسماء بنيناها بأيد وإنا لموسعون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the concept of the expansion of the universe. That the universe in which the earth and the sun and everything is in is constantly spreading. And from this word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, la musi'oon, he uses the lam, the letter lam at the beginning to show the word in its exaggerative form. Meaning not only does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prove or say and mention to me and you that the universe is expanding it is also expanding at a rapid rate or expanding a lot because when me and you think of something expanding as time goes on it slows down as it's expanding however as for the the universe it is expanding at a rapid rate and what's amazing about this concept of the expansion of the universe is that we did not understand it until Edwin Hubble, he used his famous telescope in which he looked into the universe, he looked into the space and he seen these stars moving further and further from each other. Everything in the universe is moving further and fur further from each other. And in a way for me and you to understand this, imagine a flat balloon in which we place dots on, we put a marker on each plot. And then we begin blowing into this balloon. We see how these dots begin to spread away from each other. And this is the example of how the universe is expanding. In addition to this great discovery, from this great discovery, we discover something equally or even greater. For logically, if as time passes, the universe is expanding, if we were to go back in time, or rewind, what is happening? It's coming together, it's retracting, correct? So much so that it's going to keep retracting and retracting and going back until the heavens and the earth and everything that is the universe is one point. Yes, brothers and sisters, it wasn't until after the discovery of the expansion of the universe that the Big Bang Theory was even thought of. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this once again. Something that me and you and science has not even realized until recently. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this. That the universe and the heavens and the earth and everything that was inside the universe was, one, was in one point or one point of matter or one primary nebula. And then from that, a big bang happened in which everything spread. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in when he, when he says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَ تَارَقْتُمَا تَارَقْتَا فَفَتَكْنَاهُمَا That do the unbelievers not see that the heavens and the earth was once in one entity. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it burst, made it split. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated them. And this is exactly what is said by the scientists today. And what is amazing from this statement, the statement made by Dr. Don Lincoln, he says that if we were to look at the Big Bang and when that single point, that primary nebula split out, it was of such high temperature that soon clouds of, of gaseous material, gaseous uh, substance, occupied what is the universe. So this Big Bang was so hot that these gases began to release. And as he says, that it's more logical for me and you to say, it's more correct for me and you to say, that these gases were like smoke. So the initial state or the initial condition of the universe was that of smoke. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, amazingly enough, he mentions that the universe was one smoke in his statement in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the universe was one smoke. Once again, recent discoveries in which me and you find is in this book in which was revealed to a man in the middle of the desert 1400 years ago. And then after this, this, this smoke or this gaseous material, it is from that that the galaxies and the stars and the planets would form. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these objects many times in which me and you are going to discuss. However, one thing that I want to mention before we mention that is that in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is in between them. For as me and you know from the verses in which me and you read, a lot of the times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the heavens and the earth and that which is in between. In fact, in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says specifically, الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created the heavens, the skies, and the earth, and that which is in between them. What is this in between them referring to? In the 1920s, the American chemist and Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Irving Langmuir, he says, and he makes this groundbreaking discovery. He says and he discovers that in addition to solid, liquid and gas, there is a fourth state. There is a fourth state other than these three that we commonly hear of and we commonly know. And this fourth state is not found in earth. It is not naturally found in earth. And it is something that is not above the skies. It is not above or outside of the observable universe. Rather, it's inside of it. What is this fourth state of matter? It is plasma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He has created the, heaven, the heavens, the skies, and the earth, and that which is in between them. And plasma is that which is in between them. And once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran, which me and you would figure out in the 1920s and even later. In addition to these objects in which we are referring to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two in which me and you are very familiar with. It is the sun and the moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them many times in the Quran. And He describes them by different adjectives or different characteristics. He describes the sun as a siraja, as a burning lamp. And He describes the moon as a light, a nur or munir. And what's amazing about this, about these characteristics in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes to these two bodies in space, is that it describes exactly their function and exactly what they are. And what the Quran means by this is that the moon is an, is an inert body which simply reflects light, having no light on its own. And, it is, and the sun is a celestial body in which is in a state of permanent combustion producing heat and light. And although there was, for the sake of argument, there was a handful of Greek philosophers who did mention that the sun was, that the sun was some type of, of heat source, of some type of light, and that the moon was not its own light. However, the Quran's case is unique and special. For even if we were to look at Greek philosophy, they had many errors in which they predicted. So simply this one in which they coincidentally got right, this does not mean the Qur'an borrowed that or this takes away anything from the Qur'an. For one, there was no way for the Qur'an to confirm that which they said. And the second is that the Qur'an adds to that description. It adds to that meaning. For there was no one before that ever described the sun as burning. And what is so special about knowing the sun is burning is that brothers and sisters a long time ago, not too long ago in fact, we, the common belief was that the sun was eternal, that it's always going to be there. However, when we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's burning, anything that is burning once it comes to a state in which that it's burned out or it dies out. And by understanding that it's burning in the other verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the sun, He mentions that it's going to die. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in one of the verses, and the sun runs on its course until its stopping point. And what we understand from this verse is two things. That one, the sun is going to die. And the second is that which would not be mentioned until 1783 by a Greek astronomer in which this concept is referred to as the solar apex, meaning that the sun is not stationary. The sun is not stationary, does not stay in the same spot, nor does it stay in the, the same pattern in which it goes around. 
Rather, it's going towards something. And at that something, when it reaches, it's going to die out. Once again, we see that the Qur'an mentions this many, many years before. And in addition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning these two bodies, and the sun, in fact, moving towards something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the planets and the, and the stars and the moon and the sun, each of them moving or doing some type of movement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran many times that the sun and the moon and the earth and all the celestial bodies, all the bodies in space are orbiting, are swimming around something or orbiting something. And now we just came to that conclusion that the sun is orbiting around something. And that's something else than the, the solar apex. It is orbiting around something. And the moon is orbiting around something. And the earth is orbiting around something. And all these planets, they are orbiting, orbiting around something. And in addition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or uh, uh, in addition to science not mentioning this, when the philosopher Galileo, he did mention or refute geocentrism, which was the common belief of the people in which said that the earth was the center of the universe. He never said anything about the sun not being stationary. So even those who did make some type of similarity to the Quran before the Quran, they did not complete the description in which the Quran completes. It does not give the information in which the Quran completes. And in addition to things going places, Subhanallah, we know of another thing, and this is probably one of the most amazing things I learned when I was researching this topic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions another thing that goes somewhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I swear by the retreating stars, those that run on their course and disappear. And what is this referring to? I'm going to read to you the exact definition which NASA has on their website. NASA says, a black hole is a place in space where gravity pulls so much that even light cannot get out. And this gravity is so strong because the matter has been squeezed into a tiny place. This can happen when a star is dying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say in the Quran? He mentions the receding star. When they go someplace and disappear, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say disappear? For as nasa.gov says, this black hole is so strong that even light can't escape. Me and you, we can't even see the black hole because it is something that is invisible. The only way we have any type of hint in order to understand where is a black hole or what is a black hole is because when the star approaches it, it is completely different from the stars away from it. Once again, amazing things in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in which we just recently figure out and understand. And this, for the sake, the black hole was not discovered until 1958 by, the, the, by Dr. David Fickenstein. It was not discovered until 1958. And finally, we go to the earth, the planet in which me and you reside on and live upon. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this earth many times in the Quran. And one thing that in which me and you are going to discuss specifically is the shape of the earth and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points towards the earth being a round shape. And once again, although ancient Greek philosophy did mention some type of this, once again, we cannot take any credit from the Quran away because once again, there were many major mistakes in Greek philosophy, in Greek theology for them to randomly pick one or two concepts and co coincidentally get it right. But once again, we cannot take any credit away from the Quran, even though ancient Greek, ancient Greece did mention it in a couple of places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact even stands out, or the Quran even stands out in its explanation of the earth's shape. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He wraps the day into the night 
and the night into the day. And this word rap or yuqawwir in the Arabic language is used by the Arabs in which to signify wrapping the turban around the head. And in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses, uses the word koyuz the night into the day and koyuz the day into the night. Or in the Arabic language, he uses the word yulij, yulij layla fin nahar. And this word yulij or koyuz means a slow transition. If the, if the earth was not a, a was, was it spherical or round or a, 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 that type of a circular way or that circular shape, then it would be impossible for the night to slowly transition into the day and for the day to slowly transition to the night. As we now understand when we see the globe or when we see the earth spinning on its axis and that's what's quote unquote setting the sun and quote unquote rising the sun. For the sun does not go down or up. Rather, it is us that moves. And the Quran proves that and shows that to me and you. And there are many other verses in which we can quote that show that the earth was spherical in the ways of the Quran. Never, even in fact, no Islamic scholar or no Mufassir, one who explains the Quran, ever explained or ever understood that the, that the earth was flat or that the earth was another shape other than round. In fact, you have scholars like Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hazm and Ibn al-Jawzi who specifically write in their books and hint that the earth was a round shape. Meaning that they never, no Muslim ever understood the earth being of any shape other than a spherical shape. And in addition to the earth, something that even me personally, I thought was a part of earth and many people think is a part of earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this concept and shows the true reality of what this is. And this is the ozone layer. For the ozone layer is not a part of Earth. And as science tells me and you, it is at least 20 miles above Earth. It is at least 20 miles above Earth. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. And in addition to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the place of the ozone layer, He also tells me and you the main function of the ozone layer, something that would not be discovered until very recently, until 1913. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقْفًا He has made the sama, the, the skies or the heavens once again. He does not say He made from the earth or on top of the earth. He says in the heavens, in the sky, He has made a ceiling, muhafiza, a protected ceiling protecting me and you from what even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not make that direct connection subhanallah the next verse speaks about the sun and now me and you know that the the function of the ozone layer is to protect me and you from the uv rays that are, are coming from the sun and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this is a protection and that it is above the earth Will me and you now not ponder upon these verses? Will me and you now not understand that this, this Qur'an is for the Arab Bedouin who knew, didn't know science and is for me and you who live in a day and age that all we speak about is science and facts. Facts that even in the 1900s didn't emerge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals them to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he did not, you can say from what is recorded to me and you in the ahadith, he did not ex understand these verses in the way that me and you can now understand these verses. And the Quran has that which everyone asks for. If someone asks for the scientific proof, show me where, anywhere in which what we discussed today is not solid, concrete evidence in science. And although the Quran is backed up by science, Wallahi al-Azim, anyone with a sincere heart, they wouldn't need this. By verily just opening the Qur'an and reading it with an open heart will make you see, will expose you to the reality of you seeing that this is not the, the, the words of man. This is something divine. But for those who do seek or just want the education to see what the Qur'an says about this and that, the Qur'an has that. And in addition to, the, to the, uh, the cosmology and the astrology, once again, 
We have anatomy in the Quran. Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the books I read in preparing for this lecture, he writes 200 pages about simply the human body and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the human body in the Quran and how we wouldn't come to very late in time to discover these things. Things like oceanology, things like hydrology, the, the, the water cycle. All of these things mentioned in the Quran just for me and you to read and open and understand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me and you from those who can learn the Quran in order that we can improve ourselves in it and can help those who seek knowledge from it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from me and you from the people of the Quran. Not only those who analyze and read its verses, but also memorize these verses and are affected by these verses and make these verses embedded in our heart and affect our character. For Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, when explaining who the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, she said his character was like that of the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make my character and your character that of the Qur'an. وَآخِرْ دَعْوَانَا أَنَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ If anyone would like to ask any questions or comments or any further uh, explanation on one of the points I discussed, you are, uh, you are free to ask me any question, inshaAllah. When I look at the verse in the Quran, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah and many other places in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges those, the disbelievers and those who doubt the Quran, you see that during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu this challenge was a linguistic challenge. It was a challenge of linguistics. Can you bring any chapter like it in language? Because you are the people of language. Isa alayhi salam in the time and place in which he came out to, health and medicine was widespread. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to cure the sick, right? And bring life to the dead. Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he was set during a time in which Fir'aun and the, 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 the people used to do sihr, black magic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set Musa with the true thing in which, you know, he threw the stick and it turned into a snake. And we see this example through many of the prophets. So it just shows me and do that, that no matter what day and age we live in, for anyone to claim that the Quran doesn't have that, that divine proof to me, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. For if whatever time and age you live in, it will be that stepping stone. Because people say that Islam is just a relief. It's just me believing in the unseen. But we see things that appoint to me and look directly in my eyes and your eyes to give me that initial jump. So that's all that it's for is that initial jump. Now something that you said, there's two points in which I know many people know of of the, the scientific miracles that prove the universe and the creation of the universe that I purposely left out because people criticize these two things. And to show me and you that we don't need those two famous miracles, I left them out to show you there's many others. The first is the splitting of the moon. NASA in 1970, 80, 90, whenever they released those pictures about the surface of the moon, we clearly seen hundreds of kilometers of a crack on it. And then a lot of the Muslims refer to the verse in the Quran and the incident in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "Anshakat al qamar that the moon has been split. However, NASA they themselves commented about this, and they said that the splitting of the moon has no legitimacy. Yes, there's a crack in the moon, but that does not point towards it. Even though me and you can look at the crack and say this can be referring to that, but hey, you guys don't want to accept that. We don't need that." I'm not dependent on it. Just because you guys deny that concept doesn't mean I have to forfeit my belief. Second is when we're talking about the earth's shape. Many of us heard that the Quran says in Surah Nazi'at that the Quran is egg-shaped. They use the word Dahaha and they split it into two words. 
ha meaning to it as we commonly know it akalta i ate it this is the haha allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to the earth dha and dha comes from the word the same root word as an egg and this shows that the earth is an egg shape but we don't make those jumps i don't need to make that jump but these clear signs such as the sun being in its orbit such as the, the, the ozone layer and everything that we mentioned today, these are clear that the, the heavens and the earth were once one. This big bang theory that everyone went crazy when they discovered, even the expansion of the universe, these are clear as day, even if the science wanted to reject them. I'm looking at them say, this is just an amazing fact. So it's just to answer your question, I know I talked a lot, but to make that, that, that stepping stone, to give me a new that initial jump, and then I'm going to see the Quran provides me way more than that, than just those scientific proofs. Um, I know you touched on it a little bit, but can you uh, just go a little bit in depth in the uh, miracles of the embryology in, in the Quran? No. If you have? Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in, in several places in the Quran, He mentions the stages of a baby or the infant or the whatever you want to call it inside, inside the, 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 woman, the, the, the mother's womb. And at first, as we all know, He describes that as a alaq, as a blood clot or as a as some type of material and each of these definitions or these linguistic meanings of kla or of alaq refers to the, the, the this characteristic of the initial state of the baby the blood clot meaning the way it looks and we also seen that it's something that is suspended something that's hanging down and if you were to see the, the, the embryology state how we hang down from the umbilical cord something that sucks like a leech right how we suck the nutrients out of our mother. So we see this constantly in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains these things. And once again, speaking of uh, embryology, there are some people who say that there was once again a Greek philosopher or someone who, who mentions these states. Now, if we were to just go to these texts in which they refer to, and we were to just look at it with an open mind, something that these people don't even do, we were to see that there is clear gaps in the way that Greek philosopher, that Greek doctor many years before Islam, many, before, many years before the Quran came down, is missing many stages. And some of the stages are flipped or moved. And when the Quran mentioned it, it explained it in more detail. And as when the Quran is saying it, it's going to be recited by me and you for, until the, the end of times. So if the Quran was going to say something, know that it's something that no matter what time comes later on, it will never be able to disprove. So that's with. Uh, with, with the alaq, with the, the, the way that me and you are in the embryological stage, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our bones, He adds the flesh, then adds the skin, and He goes on very descriptively on this uh, topic. Um, would you be able to repeat the questions when it's asked? Okay, yeah, sorry. Say it right now. His, uh, his question was, can you describe the embryology uh, miracle that a lot of people quote? I explained it to the best of my ability. And there's many works from many scholars and many uh, Muslim speakers that explain this. And uh, Anas asked if these Quranic verses are not met or are not dependent upon scientific proof in order to prove the Quran to me and you. Why, is, uh, why are we going over it? Why are we looking at it? And Alhamdulillah, we answered that as well. There are a couple, but like I said before, when preparing for this lecture, I wanted it to be 100% concrete. Repeat the question, there, uh, uh, one, The thing that he said, is there anything I left out purposely, like I said, with the earth shape and with um, Allah Muhammad, uh Muhammad, the splitting of the moon. There are many other ones, but the jump or the, the gap in between the specific connection between them, I chose to leave out just so that it can be 100% solid concrete connection between what science says so late ago and what the Quran says. However, once again, for anyone who would like, I will share on the Facebook page of this uh, of this event any of the books that I read or any of the articles I read to show those other uh, miracles in the astronomy and everything like that. Like An anatomy. anatomy, okay. No, the anatomy, Ibn Qayyim, the book I'm going to refer you guys to, literally has 200 pages about it. So it's way, way way too much that I can even possibly uh, talk about today but I will give you that book and inshallah you can read it it's in English as well they have a translated version or in Arabic whatever you feel more comfortable in and you can read them step by step how even the organs and the brain and the the, the way that the body structured how Ibn al-Qayyim goes through verse 
verse, verse. And Ibn al-Qayyim is someone who, who lived year, many years before. Maybe we can even find more things about the Quran. And maybe that's something that we can discuss maybe, inshallah, in another lecture. She asked, is there sense that people are saying uh, the possibility of us living on another planet, does that contradict the Quran or Islam or any other way? Uh, the answer to this is the same answer when people ask, are there aliens? Does the Quran deny this or accept this? And the simple, and even what she said about water, subhanAllah, in the verses of when I was researching about the, the creation of the, 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 the verse about the Big Bang, the very next statement is what? وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ from everything living, we created it from water. So SubhanAllah, just the, 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 the conclusion that we came to, in which we concluded that we need water in order to live, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says every little thing, every living thing is derived from water. The, going back to the question, can there be life on other planets or is there already life or aliens in other places? One of the simplest uh, responses from the scholars is the first verse or the second verse in Surah Al-Fatiha in which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Rabbil Alameen, He is the Lord of the worlds. Some Mufassireen say that it means this life and the next life. Others say that it means that there can be, it's not limited to, it's not denying or accepting that there can be life on other planets. And even if we do manage to live life on another planet, this does not in any way deny Islam because our main purpose in this life or in this wherever we are living is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from that which is evil. And that can be attained or achieved whether I live on Earth or Mars or Jupiter or whatever the case is. She's asking if in other religious texts are there similar verses to this. A couple of years ago when I first started getting into speaking and giving da'wah what they say, I used to quote other books and find contradictions in them. But I found it not sincere on my part for me to go to this book just to find mistakes in it. So that strategy of mine I took out of me. So anytime I'm giving a lecture, I do not worry too much about it. That being said, when it comes to the facts stated in the Bible at least, I can't say any other religious text. One thing in specific, and I do not mean this as my main point of talk. I'm not speaking about this specifically. I haven't done too much research. But from what I read and the verses of the Bible I've seen, one thing in specific is the moon. It says in the Bible that it has its own light. That it's not a reflected light, which we know from the Quran and we know from science, it says it's at its own light. And it does not point to specific things such as the Big Bang. It does not point to specific things like the expansion of the universe. Rather, its verses are more general away from that. And you have people who, who even say the Bible is false for its, for its saying that the universe is 6,000 years old. The Quran never makes that claim. And in fact, even if we were to look at some of the statements of the scholars and the way they study genealogy and lineages, they say if we were to trace back the lives of Nuh from, from, you know, from anyone or for, to Adam or to, from Yusuf to Ibrahim to all these other prophets, you clearly see that we'll surpass 6,000. So this 6,000 uh, year timeline that the Bible gives is something that Islam does not give. And there's just two of the points that I used, but once again, uh, any even advice to me and you, is me and you should stick to the Quran and something that we and you should look at it and analyze that and not really focus upon what other books say in terms of trying to disprove them. If anyone wants to say, oh, I want to read the Quran and want to see if I find that same feeling or that same vibe from the Bible, this is something that someone who is researching religion or someone who is researching or thinking about, you know, taking Islam or anything like that, they can do that. But in order for me and anyone here to find mistakes in the Bible or in the Old Testament, is something that we do not do. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> One last thing. Um, 
I know you didn't really touch on it uh, much. If you could explain a little bit of um, in how in the Quran it, it talks about the, the Hadid, and, uh, like Surah Al Hadid, how it's brought down. Okay, yeah. And that mirror. Oh, uh, that's even one thing I forgot to mention. I know of that thing. That's so, right. one thing in Surah Al Hadid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in a chapter Repeat called the, the, cha the chapter of iron, He asks, What is the miracle of iron in the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that I, I did forget to mention today, and it is something that is clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's talking about hadith, the iron, he says two things that wallahi, through it, I got an A on my history paper. I got a 100. The first 100 I ever got in my life on a paper, I got it because of these two <laughs> points in the Quran. The first was that science recently came to discovery that iron was not amongst the original things on the earth when it first formed. Rather, a meteor came and it put iron into the earth. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about iron? He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set down iron to the earth. Not that he created within uh, the earth iron. And the second thing in the very next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is what got me the A in the paper, he says, and through it, we will, we will make armies strong or we'll give them power. When I was reading in my history class about the Hittite empire, what made them defeat the people at an enormous rate, was that they discovered iron and they used it to make swords. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He set down iron and through it, He will give people strength and power. This is exactly what the Hittites used. And the empire, I believe his name is Ashura, He used in order to defeat all the people in the land. And with that, inshallah, we will close. Please, if everyone, anyone wants uh, snacks, I can't see if there is any left. <laughs> snacks or drinks, please feel to. And uh, like I said, for any of the books that I recommended for you guys to read to have a more deeper understanding, inshallah, we'll post that on the Facebook event page. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We pray. Uh,